Yo, what's up? If you got your Bibles, let's go. Isaiah uh, chapter 9, and we'll look at um, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. I can't believe that this week's already Christmas, can you? Man, this, this year has just been quite, <laughs> quite, 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 quite a blur. And as um, Eric was just saying, um, this is our last Sunday night until next year. And when we come back, uh, our first Sunday night back together will be January 9th. And um, I will be, uh, I'll be an older man, okay, um, because on January 2nd, um, I'm turning 40, um, which is, uh, which is, uh, I actually had somebody encourage me, hey, listen, when you turn 40, um, you might want to take your uh, you might want to take your dress to the next level. You, you might want to like put away your childish way because sometimes I look like a homeless thirteen year old. Um, <laughs> and so uh, so I was practicing that uh, this morning, and uh, uh, we we're about to leave the house, and my son said to me, "Dad, you look like the villain from Black Widow." <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what? <laughs> you know, because I can't I can't turn my head. I have to. I, Anyways, I, I feel like more like Batman uh, tonight. But um, anyways, when we come back, um, I'll be I'll be forty, and it'll be um, January 9th, and um, you'll you'll sense higher level wisdom coming off of the forty years of experience on this earth. And we're actually going to dive into a new series uh, starting on Sunday nights um, that'll go all the way into the spring, um, and it's called the Interrupters. And it's going to be a study of the mystic reformers within church history and the generals that brought about a restoration of the supernatural back to the church within the last hundred years. And so we're actually going to go pre-Reformation to look at the supernatural legacy within the church. And then we'll go into the great divorce, the schism between the supernatural and the Christian church that occurred through Martin Luther and the reformers. And then we will look at um, the restoration of the supernatural, the gifts and offices that begin to take place um, through, um, uh, uh, through um, uh, uh, William Branham, John G. Lake, uh, John Alexander uh, Dowie, Charles Parham. Um, it's going to be a fascinating study. For some of you, you're already familiar with some of these guys. Um, I was chatting with a, a, an, amazing, um, an amazing influencer within the body of Christ last week. And I was talking about John G. Lake, and he had never actually heard of, um, of John G. Lake. And so there's actually quite a few people in the church uh, that have no idea as far as um, really those that uh, really paid a great price for the restoration of the supernatural in, in the church. And um, I believe it's going to stir up expectancy within our hearts that's going to create a faith for encounters. Yep, yep, yep. So it's going to be it's going to be good. That all begins on uh, Jan 9. Um, the Interrupters, a study of the men and women who brought heaven to earth. It's going to be it's going to be great. Um, everyone there, Isaiah chapter nine verse six. Everyone say, "For unto us a child is born; to us a son is given, and the government." shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Tonight we're going to be looking at this theme of peace. It, it's fascinating to see um, our God, who is no stranger to chaos. We've been studying it in our origin series, that in uh, Bereshit, in the first epoch of time, was Elohim, and where did he create? In the chaos and in the darkness. Our faith begins with the prince of peace hovering in the chaos. That's how our faith begins. And, and he begins pulling order out of chaos. And this is what we see in the six days of creation is our God instituting and creating peace, or as the Hebrews would say, shalom, out of madness. And he accomplishes his mission. So mission accomplished, Elohim, right? Um, he creates man in his own image and likeness. Man 
sins against God, opening the door to the chaos box. And again, chaos and madness uh, are released onto the earth, unraveling and fracturing everything that God created, that the sin affected everything. Everything that God created experienced some sort of fracturing because of mankind's rebellion against God. But even then, God did not give up on his sons and daughters. Why? Because he's a father. And we see this incredible storyline of the Bible where God promises that through the seed of, 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 of Eve, um, and through the seed of uh, Adam, would come forth a redeemer, would come forth a restorer, would come forth the one that would bring forth peace, the one that would bring forth shalom. And then you read through the Old Testament scriptures. So if I was to give you the storyline of the Bible, you have beauty and glory and purity, the excellence of Christ Jesus. And then you have the fall, which is the rebellion, uh, the turning away from God's perfect plan. But then you see Christ, our Redeemer, comes, okay? He comes, he lives, he dies, he resurrects uh, from the dead. And then he sends Holy Spirit to come and live in an empowered people to likewise live the mission of Christ from heaven to earth to execute the righteous justice of God leading up to the culmination and the restoration of all things. When, when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down, down and kisses the earth and we see the restoration of all things. So we see beauty leading to beauty and yet we have this great tension in the middle and where we find ourselves in, the, in this apostolic church age is this interesting place that unlike the prophets of old, they were declaring that he is coming, Christ our Redeemer, he is, he is coming. And yet, in the age where we live, we know that Christ has come. And yet, when Jesus came, he didn't fulfill all of the expectations of the Jewish people, and that frustrated them. There was a great amount of frustration because they wanted him to restore his physical kingdom. He wanted, uh, the Jewish people wanted to see the Romans receive a good old-fashioned butt-whipping, and he didn't give it to him. Instead, he gave his life. And we didn't get to see, really, um, the justice of Jesus executed the way that the, the Jewish people longed to see it executed. And to a certain degree, there was a certain amount of disappointment in the people. We thought you were the judge. We thought you were the redeemer. We thought you were going to be the one that would restore everything back to the way it was. And instead, you died, you resurrected, and then you left. And now, we find ourselves, again, in an age or era of tension. Why? Because we have our Redeemer. We have our, uh, uh, the promise of Christ. We have our salvation. We have glorious Holy Spirit. And we have a measure of power. And yet we wait for the fullness to come. And yet we wait for the, for the second coming of Christ. And yet we wait for him to return on a, on a great white horse with the sword of the Lord coming from his mouth and the fire of God uh, 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 raging in his eyes where he will come back um, uh, to judge nations and to, and to, and to judge uh, principalities and powers and even Satan himself throwing him into a lake of fire. So we find ourselves in this tension where we have our salvation that is secure. We are in, under a new covenant of mercy. Hallelujah. And we find ourselves in this place where, where we get to experience the future restoration of all things, invade the present through our hands, feet, and through our influence. We get to see these moments of where, where all of a sudden 
justice is executed and blind eyes can see and mute tongues can sing and people who are crippled can begin to walk and yet there are other times we don't see that. There are other times when we don't get to see healing manifested here and now. That is part of the tension uh, in, this, in this age in which we live is that yes, the kingdom of God has come and yet is coming. We live in this place of, 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 of a certain amount of fulfillment and, and obvious, radical, supernatural empowerment. And yet, we still live in the tension that Satan and his hordes and his, his demonic strategies and, and agendas are still loosed on the earth to a great degree. The earth is still the wild west and there are outlaws uh, that, are, that, are, that are loose all over the earth. There are demonic principalities and powers that think that they just get to do what, whatever they want. They think that this is their earth and they think that a lot of them they think that the church is even their their church and we see we see a lot of weird stuff within the earth and this this what i'm referring to as weird stuff is the very opposite of shalom what we see is the chaos of the kingdom of darkness and, and what I'll just refer to as demonic outlaws and generations and nations that are looking for kingdom deputies of righteousness that have been given the authority and the opportunity to execute the righteous judgments of God in order to drive out the darkness, to drive out these demonic powers, to drive out these demonic... I'm a fan of Western movies. My favorite movie is Tombstone. I'm your holiday. Okay, that doesn't matter. I, I, I'd love to go on some rabbit trails with you, but I got to get you out of here. Um, in, the, in the Westerns, you always have the, you, a, a saloon scene, and you always have these, these bad boys that think that the law does not apply to them. And it's such a classic scene. You got the piano player. You got ladies that aren't necessarily dressed all that appropriately. And you got a lot of card playing. And you got a lot of whiskey drinking. All of a sudden, you have the bad boys. And they come rolling into the saloon. And the piano player stops. And everybody stops talking. And these guys come in and just start stirring up havoc. Right on cue. And everybody gets caught. And then there's all the scene where all of a sudden the good guy comes into the saloon and calls out the bad guys and lets them know that their lawlessness will not be tolerated today. And what do they have to do? They have to step outside. And then you have the famous scene where the, where the outlaw and the deputy go back to back and they pace it out they turn around and the fastest draw wins this is a picture of what real peace looks like you see for the generation that was alive in the 60s um that survived um the 60s um where everybody was you know burning bras, getting high, and singing Give Peace a Chance. There was this idea that peace is an emotion that exists if we can just get all wars to cease. Man, if we could just get everybody high enough that we'd forget about our anger for one another, we'd all start to love each other. And what the world needs now is love, sweet love. The problem with this idea of, of peace, okay, when we're singing Peace on earth. Okay, this is not talking about doing whatever it takes to make everybody happy. Do whatever it takes to absolve all conflict. Do whatever it takes to pacify people, to, to perform for people. Do whatever it takes just to get people to get along. That peace is not just 
trying to get people to get along. How many of you, this Christmas holiday, um, you're already having conversations with family members just trying to get everybody to play nice? Okay, don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. I'm not looking. Uh, there's a couple of you raise your hand, but I just see your hand. That's between you and the Lord, okay? Um, what, okay. Peace, as the Hebrews understood it, that peace is actually not an emotion, but peace is actually a verb. And what the word means is to drive out all anarchy that brings anxiety. What's, what's anarchy? It's lawlessness that leads to injustice. That the Hebrew word shalom means to drive out all lawlessness that brings injustice. That anywhere that we look and we see the effects of injustice, we could talk about physical injustice. This is injustice within our own bodies. If shalom, okay, if peace, of, 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 if the fullness of all of our faculties operating according to God's original intent and purpose, how would that apply, and this is just an example, how would that apply to our eyes, for example? Well, eyes are meant for seeing. Okay? So when our eyes can see, okay, you got 20-20 vision, that, that's justice, our eyes are functioning according to their original intent of our awesome creator, God. When people go blind and they can no longer see, your eyes are breaking the law. Why? Because it's the law that eyes are to see. So when Jesus spit in the mud... And made a nice little pace, right? And wiped it in, into the blind man's eyes. And when, when those eyes were healed, Jesus was not suspending the natural order of things. He was restoring it. And in doing so, he executed justice. Driving out the lawlessness that brought about injustice. to Everything from evangelism. What does it mean to actually lead someone into a relationship with Jesus and now they get a saving one, Christ the Savior, who steps into their life, drives out the fear and releases the perfect love of the Father? What is that? It's peacemaking. That's justice. Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, not blessed are the peacekeepers. We already have a UN and we all know how helpful they are. <laughs> we don't need more peacekeepers, we need peacemakers. If you know anything about Wyatt Earp, you would know that Wyatt Earp was a famous sheriff that had a, um, I think it was a Colt 45. He had a gun, okay. I say Colt 45, you're like, oh, he had a pony, he had a horse. No, no, no. He had a really big gun. And the name of his gun was the Peacemaker. And the picture of peacemaking is confronting the areas of injustice that have inserted themselves within our physicalities, within our minds, our will, and our emotion. Those things that have tricked us into thinking this is the new normal. Be careful what you accept as the new normal. Because if it's not in heaven, you probably shouldn't call it the new normal. These guys that we're going to read about, you're going to read about uh, John G. Lake. You're going to read about um, Oral Roberts. You're going to read about A.A. Allen. A.A. Allen believed that sickness was a demon. We read about Jesus going, and you know what it says? He went about healing all who were oppressed. What's the picture of that? Jesus, the deputy, armed, 
driving out all the demons that were bringing sickness, disease, and affliction. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. He's coming. Who's coming? The Prince of Peace is coming. What's he coming to do? He's coming into the darkness, just like he did in Genesis 1. He's coming into the chaos, just like he did in Genesis 1. But this time, he's coming as a baby. And what's he coming to do? He's coming to administrate peace. He's coming to reconcile a people unto the Father through himself, our high priest and perfect mediator. And in doing so, he will demonstrate to a company of peacemakers what it looks like to confront injustice, to confront the injustice of shame, to confront the injustice of, of, of religious manipulation, to confront the injustice of infirmity, sickness, to confront the injustice of death itself. It says that Jesus approached the tomb of Lazarus. He had been dead for three days, which is interesting because within Hebrew culture, they believe that this concept, that the spirit would be linked to the body for three days and that there would be three days to have your goodbyes, to do whatever you needed um, to do, but that your spirit was still linked to your body, that the cord was still attached for three days, at which point the spirit would leave the body and go to Abraham's bosom. What does Jesus do? He waits till the fourth. And after weeping, entering into a place of empathy, he transitions from weeping into a place of rage. The language communicates the emotion of the Christ in that story as one who resembles a bull with a nose that's snarling with smoke coming out of his nose. That Jesus approached the tomb of Lazarus with rage against the injustice of death itself, and he does not pray for Lazarus. He commands him. He commands him to come underneath the authority of life. He rebukes the spirit of death and he says, doesn't really give him much of a choice. Lazarus, come forth. Not tomorrow, not next year, right here, right now. And in doing so, Jesus enters the the saloon and says, death, You can step outside. (laughs) This is our Prince of Peace. This is our mighty God. This is the one who is not afraid of our conflict. This is the one who empathizes with us in our brokenness, but never wants us to assimilate our brokenness or infirmity as part of our identity. You are a righteous son of God. And any area of demonic injustice within your physicality, within your psyche, within your spirit, if it's not of God, don't say it's of you. You can wrestle with stuff, but don't ever allow your sickness and disease to become who you are. It is not who you are. The Lord wants to so set us free and to fill us with a passionate Anger for all demonic lawlessness that comes to bring injustice because this needs to be the drive for the supernatural. The supernatural was never given to the church just to bring mere astonishment and wonder in and of itself. We have to have a theology for the supernatural where we see that all supernatural acts exist to bring forth the shalom of heaven. A driving out of anarchy that brings 
anxiety. Blessed are the peacemakers for what? They are the sons of God. And this is why Paul would say, hey, you're going to have to stand firm. And the days where we're going, it's going to be imperative that you stay standing. And what does he say to the believers at that time? How are you going to stay standing? You're going to need to shod up your feet with the preparation of the gospel of This is what Paul says. You're going to need to put on your sonship's shoes. Your sonship shoes are your shoes of peace. Now, what's interesting about the Roman shoes is that when um, Romans would wear their, 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 their war shoes, okay, these shoes of peace that Paul's actually talking about are battle shoes. And what they looked like is they looked like golf shoes on steroids. So out the bottom of the soles were these long nails. And the Roman soldiers would use these shoes because here's the thing. A Roman that falls down and hits the ground is a dead Roman. So if you did not stay standing, if you hit the ground, you would be slain. Which is why Paul is speaking to the church and he's saying, having done all, (laughs) standing is the win. Let me tell you something. Sometimes sometimes we always want to just be victorious and all this stuff. But let me tell you something. The win is you just stay standing. You feel overwhelmed, just close your eyes and go, la, 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 I'm still standing. Yeah, 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 right? These shoes with these big uh, nails would, would, would secure them in the mud in slippery terrain so that they could fight in slippery terrain. How many of you, you, you felt like you've been in some slippery terrain for the last couple of years? Wave at me. But these shoes, these cleated shoes, if need be, Romans would actually at times use their war shoes to kick their opponent. These battle shoes were not just functional to keep them standing. They would use their battle shoes offensively to attack the enemy. And these are the shoes... That Paul calls shoes of peace. (laughs) Shod up your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It'll keep you standing. Here comes the prince of peace. And what does Satan unleash? Radical chaos. Radical darkness. This Christmas Eve... We're in for such a special treat. Pastor Masood is going to share with us the Christmas story. And we're going to read the Christmas story. And we're going to read about Mary who was promised a baby. And she responds by saying, may it be according to your word. And then Joseph finds out about it. And what does he say? Yeah, I'm not down for this. You're pregnant and it's God's baby? (laughs) I don't think so. Deuces. It says that he secretly, he secretly planned for his divorce. And then the angel Gabriel came and spoke to Joseph and said, she's telling the truth, you're not going anywhere without Mary. And they begin this epic journey. King Herod finds out about God made flesh, Emmanuel, and does what? Begins killing all of the male babies. We see all this radical disruption, turmoil, and fear. And what is the fear coming to do? The fear is coming to do what it always does. To interfere. To interfere. And yet, God has his way. And Joseph obeys. And Jesus is born. And the father protects His son. And his son is raised. His son lives, dies, resurrects, ascends, is seated at the right hand of the Father where he does what? Where he prays for his church. Knowing that like Christ, we came from the Father's heart 
to our mother's womb. From the perfection and shalom of everything wrapped in the genetic generational chaos of our parents. Born into spiritual amnesia, having no idea who we are and what we were created for. And then launched forth into this incredible journey where God in his providence and in his sovereignty brings us to a point where he reveals himself. And by his grace, we can confess our sins, declare his lordship, and be saved from all of our sins past present and future but that's not the end of the story at that point he calls us he equips us he anoints us and he infills us to do what to do what his son did to return back into the chaos to return back into the madness to step into the saloon and to say Darkness, injustice, chaos. This place is not your home. God has given you jurisdiction. He's given you the gun and the badge. He's given you the means. He's given you the heart. He's given you the motive. This is an incredible invitation to enter into the revelation of the peace of God. Hallelujah. How do we do this? How many of you need peace? You, your kids need peace. Your boss definitely needs a lot of peace. Come on, your boss needs Jesus. Yeah? She needs Jesus. How do we actually step into this? First of all, just declare with me right now. We receive Christ Jesus as our Savior and source of peace. Peace is not an emotion, okay? You can listen to the sounds of whales all you want. You can, you can meditate. You can do all of this stuff. It's all temporary. Okay? You, you, don't, need to, you don't need the sounds of, of nature. You don't need 10 hours of ocean waves crashing. You need Jesus. Peace is not an emotion. It's a person. Yeah? Everybody says, everybody thinks that good people go to heaven. No. Good people do not go to heaven, forgiven people go to heaven, and you need forgiveness, so do I. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. The Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, you're a whosoever, and so am I. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he will be faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins. And his glorious spirit will swan dive right into your chaos and pull you out of that place, establishing the order of his kingdom within your heart. And you will grow from that day forward invisibly, perhaps slowly, but inevitably the glorious fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is righteousness, peace, I'm sorry, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that in the kingdom you transform without even trying. The second thing is that we receive the mandate of peace, meaning that we step into this invitation from Jesus to begin to drive out the lawlessness that brings injustice, and we do not tolerate evil in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits, or our homes if we can help it. Sometimes our homes look like the saloon. It's time to drive out the darkness. Everyone just clear me right now. Receive Christ. Receive the mandate of peace. And the last thing is this. I'm going to wrap this up. Stomp on the frogs. 
When? Today. Now, I know I'm being abstract, okay? I'm kind of like a Picasso preacher. Put an ear here, an eyeball there, but I'll make sense out of it. In Exodus chapter 8, Pharaoh would not let God's people go. And so the Lord releases a plague of frogs. And it says that there were frogs everywhere in Egypt. There were frogs in the house, in the bed chambers, on the beds. Um, there, there were the frogs on people. It says that there were frogs in their ovens. There were frogs in the kneading bowls and even in the dough. There were frogs everywhere. And finally, Pharaoh asked for Moses to come. And Pharaoh says, I have had enough of the frogs. What are the frogs symbolic of? Injustice. Why? Because the earth was never meant to be overcome by frogs. So, Pharaoh says, Moses, do something. I am done. This isn't fair. And Moses says, okay, here's all you have to do. Let my people go. And verse 10, this is out of Exodus chapter 8, verse 10, this is what Pharaoh said. Okay, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow. He was willing to go one more day of hell and injustice. He, he was willing to go one more day with the frogs in his house. John Scotland, he is a, um, a British uh, minister um, who tells a story. Britain is kind of interesting because the Christians go to pubs in Britain. Um, that'll get you kicked out of some denominations these days in the States. But there in Britain, it's just kind of what they do. They, they go to eat fish and chips and whatever else. John tells a story. He went into this pub, and up on the wall, there's a sign. And when you hear John tell this story, he says it with such sadness. There's such grief in his heart when he tells this story. This is what he says. He goes, I walked into the pub. And I looked on the wall. And there I read a sign. And it said, Free drinks. Tomorrow. And he says, and that's a picture of the church. Free drinks. Tomorrow. Pharaoh said, I'll deal with it. Tomorrow. You can have peace tonight. You can have all injustice driven out of your psyche, your physicality. You can, you can have Christ. And like I said, we're invited into that tension of the infilling of the spirit with glimpses of radical power within the present while waiting for the fullness to come. But even if you don't see the fullness and the completion of that manifestation that you've been contending for, you can have the Prince of Peace abiding inside of you that will so anchor your soul to him so that no matter what hell comes against you, you know that your peace cannot be removed. You know that your love cannot be removed. You know that your joy cannot be touched because these things are not mere emotions. It is the person of the Christ and his spirit is within you and you don't have to wait till tomorrow because there are free drinks tonight Jesus said all who are thirsty come and drink you who have no money come and buy tonight we need to receive Christ Christ is savior Christ is shepherd Christ is our influencer Christ is our leader Christ is our pastor 
Christ is our vine. We need to receive his peace mandate as our own mandates, knowing that he's calling for us to drive out the evil, the lawlessness that leads to injustice. And we need to lean into the tension of saying, I know that he has made his kingdom, his courts, his chambers available to me and my family tonight. I might not feel peace, but I don't bow down to my feelings. I bow to him. Christ, you are my peace. Can we stand? Can we just all uh, bow our heads? And, uh, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. If you're here tonight and you say, uh, Pastor Darren, I, I, I need Jesus. I need, the, I need a Savior. I need a, I need a helper. Thanks, man. If you'd say, Pastor Darren, I, I need Jesus. I need to make him the Lord of my life. Without anyone looking around, um, I'm going to lead us into a prayer. But if, if, if you are identifying with this tonight and you need salvation, would you just lift up your hand real high? Because I want us just all to all pray together. Awesome. God bless you. Awesome. God bless you. Just hold it up really high for like three seconds. People are responding all through this room. You, you say, I don't need an emotion. I need Christ tonight. Awesome. God bless you. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome. 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 Real quick, just hold your hand up real high and say, I, and it's not for me. It's not for my eyes. It's for, it, 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 it's for the Lord. It's you identifying. It's you saying, yes, tonight is my night. I, I believe in my heart and I want to confess with my mouth. We've had hands raised all through this place. Let's all pray together. Jesus, I need you. As my vine, as my shepherd, and as my savior. Jesus, I've sinned against you. I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins. I invite you to step into my life. To drive out all darkness. To drive out all chaos. To drive out all lawlessness. Jesus, you have full permission to know me, to inspect me. I know that you're not coming to judge me. You're coming to establish your justice in me. Jesus, I trust you. I give you my life. I give you my future. I give you my today. And I give you my yesterday. If you prayed that prayer tonight, I want to welcome you to the family of God. You're now a brother. You're now a sister. All your sins are forgiven. You can now go and sin no more. One more thing. Just assume the position again. Just say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me right now. Come and fill me right now. Holy Spirit, come right now. Fill these who have responded tonight. Come and fill them with your glorious presence right now. Hallelujah, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Yeah, there you go. Yep, 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 yep. Fill, 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 fill. Right now, right now, right now. Yep, yep, yep. Bring a revelation of sonship right now. Here is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Hallelujah, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Let your peace come right now. Let your peace come right now. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to conclude tonight by celebrating communion. His body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed. If you want to just go ahead and open up your cup there and grab the bread. It was written that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, This is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread tonight. Likewise, in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this wine is my blood. Take and drink and remembrance of me and do it often. For as often as you do, you are proclaiming 
a new covenant, a new covenant of mercy, a new covenant of grace and empowerment. You're proclaiming a new covenant, even of my promise and preparation for my return. Let's participate with his blood tonight. Let's receive this together. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your life, your light, your kingdom that's being released even into our bodies right now. We thank you, Father, for your righteous justice that's being released even to our families. Lord, your righteous peace that's invading even our memories. We thank you, Father, that we are no longer orphans. We have been adopted. And we can call you Dad. We love you. You want to sing something? You got a mic there? Don't you guys just love Josh? You guys want to sing something before we go? Let's do it. Come around the major, say, Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. Listen, if you got frogs in the oven, frogs in the refrigerator, frogs in your bed, 
frogs in your car. If you got frogs, frogs, more frogs, don't you dare leave this place until we kill some frogs. So I'm going to have our frog killers come up to the front. And it, uh, if you need prayer tonight, don't leave. You, you, come up to, you come up to the front. Let me just tell you this. That on the cross, he crushed the power of sin, sickness, death, right? The grave. But he also crushed the power of Satan. And that includes the power of witchcraft. And if you're here tonight and, 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 and you know that you are under a curse, you know um, that, that there is witchcraft that is taking place maybe in your own life, maybe you're practicing witchcraft, I don't know, but, but um, I, f- I know that in the spirit tonight. It's just called the word of knowledge. It's just where you know something. And uh, uh, so there's people here tonight. I don't know why you're here. I don't know if you're here to receive or if you're here to do your woo-woo. But listen, um, the, listen now. The frogs are not your friends. And you might think that you have power over them. You don't. You're being played, okay? And so if you're here tonight and you got, you got frogs... You got a frog roll, even if you think that you've got authority over them. If you're, listen now, if you're playing with frogs, you're actually playing with fire. And so I want, I, I want, I want to just invite you tonight to come get prayer. Let us pray, let us cast out the frogs so that you can leave free. And please don't say tomorrow. Is that good? Love you guys. Hey, Merry Christmas, all right? Have an amazing week. Bless you.